Um, all right, trip with monads. So um, the idea behind this presentation is sort of showing you guys the main principles that we had when we were implementing R chain. It, there's not going to be any R chain code itself because this presentation I actually prepared for another conference that will happen in a few days in Poland. But I reckon since actually the principles that are being try trying to solve in this presentation are sort of the principles that we use through our I train, it would be a good idea to maybe share those ideas, ideas with you guys. Um, this presentation is mainly for programmers, Scala developers, who at least are a little bit con convinced that maybe functional programming is the way to go. If you've never been programming in Scala, you should just leave the room and some, find some other place to, to, to have fun. Um, and it would be also nice if you actually read or uh, had a little bit of experience with functional programming. Right, so why should we ever write FP code? Those are the bullet points, modularity, the stability, performance, and maintainability. Those sounds really awesome. Uh, so yeah, so let's, let's do a real quick recap of sort of the building blocks that we have when we do functional programming. By the way, the code itself is in Scala Z, uh, which differs a little bit from cats that we use in our chain, but the differences are small and I will point them out where it exists. So one of the building blocks is the type either T. Either T is just a wrapper over some F of either A and B. If you don't know this, this sign, it's basically like an either type just in Scala Z. It's, you know, it's either A or, or B. That's this, this junction. And an either T is nothing else than just a wrapper over some value F of that either A or B. Um, reader. Reader is it's another building block in functional programming, and it's just yet another wrapper, this time over a function. So if you have a reader A to B, it just wraps a concept of a function from A to B. Uh, Kleisley is just a little bit more of specification of that, of that concept. So instead of going from A to B, you go from A to B closed over some M. Kleisley has a different name. And also, it's also known as a reader T. And um, uh, as you can see, you can actually define a reader in terms of reader T. So you can say reader is just a Kleisley of ID, where ID is this little trick in Scala that you can do. You can say ID of A is just an A, and it all collapses and, uh, and sort of works. I'm rushing through those, through those slides um, because those are sort of our foundations for the rest of this presentation. Um, state is just yet another wrapper. This time it wraps over a function that goes from some S, some state, to a new S and some, and some value A that is being produced. And yet, yet it, it's another building block in FP. And there's a concept of state T, which is just the generalization, generalization of it. So we have a function that goes from S to an M of tuple S and A. And then we can one more time divide state and state T. So all the, those are the building blocks, right? Like, like if you see them for the first time, it seems magical. It seems weird. And, but even after you adjust your eyes to it, even if you under, because the concepts themselves are not really that complex. They're just some function closed over some class, some value closed over some class. But then, so you can learn about this. And then, especially when you're learning about FP for the first time, and then you're sort of confused. Because the, the learning functional programming looks a little bit like this. You, you learn about, like, about reader monad, state monad, writer monad, and, all, and so on and so forth. And then you, you're thinking, like, OK, what, what's next? How do I actually can write an application in using the paradigm, using the FP paradigm? So let's try to write one application, all right? It's going to be a simple application. The idea behind the application is that you, um, it's, it's going to be a console application where you provide a, a city name, and it gives you a forecast, weather forecast for the city, and it runs in a loop. So you run it. It says hello. It tells you what service it's actually using. It's asked for a city. You give it a city. It gives you a forecast and actually remembers your calls, has some sort of like a memory where it says like the, the, the hottest cities that you found is the, the given city. So here we ask for Berlin. We get yet another temperature. And we know that for all the cities that we looked so far, Berlin is the hottest one. If you give it a name that the city doesn't really exist, the program executes with an error. Pretty simple program, right? Nothing very magical and specific to it. Right, so now let's try to actually write this program in Scala. So here, before we do anything FP magic stuff, let's talk about domain. So domain, we have some temperature. You have um, 
with some units, you have a concept of a forecast, concept of a city. Uh, there is like a third party client that we use where we call a method forecast for a given city and that gives us forecast. Let's say it's actually doing something instead of this mock-like implementation. Some helper functions like configurations and a concept of an error. Uh, and also a, uh, a, a type alias, which we call a request, which where the, it's basically just a map uh, where the keys are the cities and the values are forecast. And we use that map to store the information that the user was constantly asking when he was running our program. Now, some imports to make this valid, and we should be ready to go. So what do we really need? Well, we need to have an ability to fetch, like to run this program that we just saw a moment ago. We need to have an ability to fetch a host and port from configuration. We need to have ability to do input and outputs. So I want to ask something to the user in the console. I want to get the information back. We also need to go from a city string to actual city where the user might provide some, some city that doesn't exist, so we have to deal with errors. And we need to call our um, third party in functional way, because third party is imperative, and we want, would like to be this to be functional. And at the very end, we also need to reason about the hardest city. So we need to have ability to remember the calls and, and store somewhere the hardest city that the user was asking for. And built on those blocks, we can actually create the final program that we would like to run. So host and port is just a reader monad, nothing really specific to it, a function from configuration to string closed over a reader. Input output, well, print, print line and read line are just methods. We take the imperative code and we close it over a task Task from Monix just basically gives an, it gives an opportunity to take any imperative, effectful code, and close it over a value. Nothing really magical to it as well. City by name, well, here we have to, for a given name, we have to provide a, a, a implementation for a city. So we have Wroclaw and Berlin, but for, you know, for other, any, any other output, we just return left side unknown city. And that's good. We can, recently, we can give you an actual value or the error. All good, so far so good. So, and also we can call the uh, weather forecast and we one more time close it over task because we want to uh, delay uh, the, the, the calculation, the calling for the third party. And lastly, uh, hottest city is a function that we're gonna use to remember uh, the city state. So whenever you call hot, hottest city, it's a stand monad where it encapsulates a function. It takes map of requests, looks for the hottest one, maps to the temperature, and give you that value back. And based on that, we could actually then write something a little bit more complex. So now we are writing a function. So those are our building blocks. And now we're writing a function that will fetch a forecast. So you ask for a city. It will try to look it up in the map of all the cities that it already know. If it finds it there, it doesn't really do anything. It will just return the, oh, where is it here, uh, a pure task. So it's just it's saying, like, don't do anything else. I'm done. If, if it didn't find it in the map, if it re actually returned a none, then it will trigger the, the weather function, which calls the, the, the forecast, the third party implementation that we have. We get it back, and at the very end, we just update that map. So if you ask for this weather for the given city, it will store that information already in our cache. Let's, let's, let's just call it cache. So we, we start slowly to, and it looks a little bit more complex, it looks a little bit more weird. If, if you've never seen that in your life before, it's like you're already confused and want to leave this room. Um, ask city is another small function that we just collapse to functions, print line and read line together. So we ask for a city and we return it as a value. So ask city is a function that returns a task of string. And it will do the asking for the user and getting the output back for you. Having all that, we can finally write our program. And the program looks pretty easy, I would say, right? We ask for a city, we get a city name. We convert city name by name to a city. We fetch host and port from configuration. Using all that information, so city and host and port, we called the fetch forecast. Then we print the result. We check what's the hottest cities of all the cities that we got so far, and we print out that result as well. So now we have a function that does that, and we call that ask, fetch, and judge. And our final program will do the following. We'll ask for host and port. port. We'll print a, a sort of like a title line. We're using this weather service at this host and port. And that previous method, ask, fetch, and judge, will call forever. 
It will just forever recursively call itself. And the pro program will work as, well, as long as we, until we kill it or provide invalid output, right? Looks beautiful. Well, the only problem is this whole thing is a lie because this program will not compile. And why that is? Well, this is actually what will compile. And yes, you cannot really read that. And uh, here as well, it's probably more visible here. Unfortunately, there's this, like, if you learn a little bit about functional programming, you'll learn that monads.compose. Each of those little functions, they return a completely different thing. So host and port give you a reader. Hottest will give you state of t. Something else will give you a task. Something else will give you state t of task. But at the end of the day, in the final program, you have to merge all that into a final type. They have to be, at the end of the day, the same type. So the type that you get, uh, yeah, so it sounds like a functional programmer. sounds like a medieval monk, right, trying to pleasure, you know, be more, to be more virtuous, denying himself the pleasures of life. Like, why would you even bother? Why not to do imperative programming, right? So, so out of those four things that we strive for, the modularity, testability, performance, and maintainability, let's check the list. Modularity, uh-uh. Uh, testability, no way you can actually test that. Performance, if you do benchmarking, if you write the same program similar to this one but using imperative style of writing software and you can do that in Scala, well, it's going to be an order of magnitude faster than the FP version. And finally, maintainability, uh, if, if anybody calls this maintainable, then um, I don't know. You like pain? Um, so yes, this function ask, this function ask, fetch, and judge. Uh, returns something which is an effect type. What is an effect type? We actually constructed the effect type. The effect type is state of monads put one on top of each other, so-called monad transformers. It's state of t, of reader t, of either t, of task. And it, it's like an inception. At, at some point, you just go into limbo, right, trying to reason about it. It's just really, really hard to understand what's going on. Um, and it's, it's, it's a pain. But it works, just as, as a matter of fact. The, the nice thing about it, it's uh, running it, it's really not really that difficult. So we have our main function, we have a configuration, we have some empty map of request. Uh, here we have our program, which returned that effect unit. We need a scheduler for Monex, and then we feed the request to state T, we feed the configuration to reader T, and we, um, we run uh, the, the either T type which finally gives us a task on which we do pattern matching because we have to see whether the task will return an error or not. And we have to, if the error happens, what should we do? If there's not an error, we do nothing. And finally, we execute the whole task and it works. So yeah, fine, it works, compiles, but as again, it just sucks. So the question is, can we do better? Now, so what do we need? We need one more time, the host, the input, a city by name, forecast, and the hottest city. Same stuff. Let's try to do it actually better. What was the problem with those functions? The problem was that even though those functions, like getting, getting the city and getting, sorry, getting the host and port were straightforward, we as developers, we took the decision for our users of those functions by them. We gave them a final type, which is a reader, even we have absolutely no idea if they will ever use it with reader because maybe they need something else. Maybe they need reader T of state T of something. Maybe they just need a reader. Maybe they need a task, and they have to wrap it into reader somehow. We don't know how this function is going to be used. What we really need is this. We need to say, hey, I'm going to give you a function that will give you a host closed over some f. I have absolutely no idea what the f is. You tell me. And that's pretty awesome. You let the user to decide what the final type over which you encapsulate or effects will be. You don't, as the implementator of this function, you don't know. But well, the problem is we don't really know how to implement this function right now. We don't have enough knowledge. The f is too abstract. f can be pretty much anything, right? Can be an option, can be in, I don't know, task, you name it. But so that, that's not enough information. Luckily, there is a type class that can help us. And that type class, type class is called applicative, uh, applicative ask. And applicative ask have, has two really neat methods, ask and reader. So the idea is simple. If you have an instance of this type class, you don't know how you got it, but somebody gave it to you. So if you have an instance of applicative ask for your f, 
and some E, where that E in our example is configuration. So that's just so the E stands for environment. If you will get for free a method, a method ask that will give you an F of that configuration, or you will get a method reader that will, given the function from configuration to some A, will give you that A close, or, or clover over, closed over that F. It looks bizarre, but it works. You, if we want to have this functionality working in this method signature, the only thing that we need to do is just constrain our F. We are saying no longer this can be any F. It can only be F for which there is an instance of this applicative type class. So just a reminder, config ask is a, is a applicative ask where, where that E is a config. We, we, we fill one of the two holes. So now I can just call reader, where reader takes a function from config to something, and it will give me an F of that something, like either an FF string or an F of uh, an integer. One more time, I have writing this function, I have absolutely no idea how applicative is, uh, ask is implemented because I still don't know what the F is. And I will never know. But I'm constraining my function to only know the things that it needs to know. And it knows that it will have an ability to fetch the configuration somehow using the applicative ask. Has no idea how, but we know it works. City by name is another example. And I, will try, I, I, know, I, I don't know how much time again I, I have. I probably like 30 minutes. So a little bit faster, but the, prin the principle is going to be exactly the same thing. We used to have a city by name, which gave us, we, were, we really want to get a city, but we know sometimes error might happen. What we really would like to have is a city by name function that is close. Um, yeah, I'm missing a slide, sorry. What we really need is a city by name function that knows that we should will only give us an F of city, but it will know how to act when there's an error. And, and then we almost have this function here. We have some F, we say it's applicative. What applicative is, it gives you a function pure, so we can take any value like a city and lift it up to F. So we get an F of city, which we almost have the half of the puzzle. We have we can implement this method when we go through the happy path. But what about the error? What, what should I return? I need to return an F of city, but the error happened. I don't have a city with me. Well, the story is exactly the same. There's a type class for that. One more time, we have something which is called applicative error, which gives us a method raise error. So it means if you have an error E, whatever that E is, in our example, E is our error from our domain, I will give you the ability to, I will just give you an F of A, whatever A that is. So this type that will instantiate applicative error, uh, error, the F must be something that knows how to reason with errors. Either is one of those types, either knows how to reason with errors, right? If you have an either error or int, but you get an error, you can always say it's left, left error, or right 10, right? So. But yet, we don't know what that f is, so we don't also know what the, that error handler is. We have, we have absolutely no idea what those are, but one more time, it's enough information for us to finally implement this function, and the only thing that we need to do is just call this method rise error. Okay? Same thing, same principle for the hottest city. We used to call, we used to use explicitly state, because we need to have an access to this map of of, of requests. But to be honest, one more time in taking a decision in front for the users, we don't need to do that. We would like to just say, hot as city is a function that returns us a tuple of city and temperature, close over some f. One more time, we have absolutely no idea what a f is, and we don't want to know. So one more time, we have no means and ways to implement it right now, but there's a type class for that, and that type class is called monad state, where monad state has all those nice methods. It, it acts like a state monad, but it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be a state monad. That's the beauty of it. One of the methods that we're going to look here, we're going to use here is, for now at least, is inspect. So it will give us ability that, given that we have function from state to some A, it will give, you, give us the F of A. And, um, 
one more time, we, we create a type alias where we fill one of those holes. So our requests are those S. So the hottest city is, is yet again, we say F is constrained by request state. And one more time, we can just use this type class. One more time, we don't know what that type class internally is, the instance of this type class, because we don't know what the F is. We push, that's the beauty of functional programming. You have a problem, you just push that to somebody else. You deal with that. I, I will give you the hottest city close over F, fine, no problem, but you tell me what the F is, and you tell me how to get access to the state of that F. I don't want to deal with those issues, you tell me. We are putting constraints on the user, at the same time we give them more flexibility of what types they can use, and also, and it's very important for the pers from the perspective of maintainability, we constrain the space of possible solutions. Because the, the more your implementation is abstract, the, more of, the, more, the, 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 the number of ways you can provide a valid or I mean compiling implementation, shrinks from infinity to just few. Um, so here we use that inspect and it works. That style of programming is called MTL. And MTL stands for words I don't want to give you because they are confusing and there's the history of that and just, just leave it where it is in, in the 70s. Um, but that way of programming gave us this flexibility to reason about some, some of parts of our functions the hottest city where we need to reason about state, the reader where we need to get access to configuration and so forth and so forth. What about this guy, the input or output? Well, there are no type classes like that in any library, both in Scala Z and, uh, and uh, in, in CATS. So what's the only way that we could do if we want to continue this, if we have the same way of writing software? The only thing that we can do is just provide our own type class. Let's call it console with two functions, read line and print line, they would, so an instance of this type class will know exactly how to write and read to the console. We don't know what the F is, but at least we know if it's gonna have an instance of console, it will know how to do it. And now writing an ask city is just saying, you know, ask city will give you an F of string, the name of a city, given that it knows how to use console. And that's the implementation. Whether same thing. We used to close whether our third party over, over task delay to be functional. Right now, we just, just create a whether type class. We are not even saying how that type class is implemented. We're just saying if there's going to be an instance of this type class, we will know how to fetch a forecast for a given city. And um, here is the same example where, remember how we were building, so has slowly had those building blocks um, where we get a city, try to get a, a, um, a forecast for it. If we find it, then we return it. Uh, sorry, trying to look at it in, in cache. If we find it, then we return it. If it doesn't exist, we call the service. This right now is implemented with those functions. The fetch forecast is a, 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 a function that we build out of those building blocks, and it still returns an F. We still don't know, we have absolutely no idea what the F is, and we need to know, and that's the beauty of it. That way of writing software is called, sometimes it's referred to as tagless final, which MTL is just a, just a small subset of tagless final, I would say. Now, this final program will compile the ask, fetch, and judge, where we ask for a city, we fetch a forecast, we call console, and we ask how a city. This is completely readable, readable and will compile. But one more time, this program is still pushing the complexity of it to the user. We, the complexity will never disappear from your program, regardless of the paradigm that you use. The problem, the, the, the whole thing that you can do is manage it. And the way we manage it is we are pushing the complexity out to the far boundaries of our pro program where they are in a single place. So we wrote our ask, fetch, judge function still by saying, it's going to run with some type F. We don't know what F is, but all those are all constraints that are needed in order for this function to run. I need to know how to fetch a forecast for weather. I need to know how to communicate with console, how to store requests, and how to do error handling. Compiles. Same goes for, the, for, for that uh, initial program function. So now, how we make this main function to work? Um, well, 
we have our program. Uh, we have our configuration, an empty request. Now we need to figure out what the effect is, that F, right? We need to add, lastly, like we, so far we were just saying, oh, it's going to be some F. We actually didn't really know what that F is, sadly. Well, this time we have to decide what that F is. We are finally at the boundary, at the main function. This is it. This is where, like, things get real, right? We need to decide what that final F, what this type is going to be, that effect type here. So, could it be task? Well, we had constraints on, on console. We had constraints on, on weather type class, right? So let's see, like, they are not here. They're not implicitly provided, so the compiler will complain. So how could we provide an instance for the weather forecast? We can just, um, I made a mistake here. Sorry, for the console. It was supposed to be for the console. Where for the console, we, the instance of that type class is going to be trivial. It's going to be wrap task, uh, wrap the imperative part of programming into task, and that's it. That's what we've seen before. But it doesn't infect the rest of our code. It's only defined in, yeah, I messed up my slides. It's supposed to be the other way around, sorry. But you get, sort of get the idea is that for weather, so for console and weather, we have those two instances, and they do the imperative stuff closed over task. But that's defined at the end of the world in the main function. What about other stuff? Um, getting um, state? Well, we can provide instance of monite state very simply. We just say our type is state of task. And that's it. This will, this will get the, the monite, monad state instance for free. What about applicative ask? Where, well, applicative ask gives you, uh, uh, has an instance for a reader. So we can extend our type to be a state of t of reader t of task. And we need to deal with errors, and the same, the same principle applies. We just add yet another um, stack. So our final type is still that messy, messy, messy stack of monad transformers. We are not done yet, but the, we, are, we are getting there, at least we are dealing with all that crap at the very, very end. The whole logic of the program is completely unaware of what's the final type that the program is going to be using. Um, and yeah, and this is how you could, you could run it. So out of those four things that we strive for in functional programming, we get the modularity. We get the testability as well. Think about this function, how you could, how you could test it, really. In a previous implementation, that would be very, very hard. But right now, I could provide just in my test, just for my unit test, an instance for console that for println, it doesn't really do anything. It just, it's just like nothing, whatever, I'm done. But for read, read line, it will always give you a constant value. So just for one test, you provide an instance of console li like that. It's not using the actual console. It is a very specific one for the test. That will always give you, say, let's say, Berlin, and that's it. We can now provide an instance of a weather forecast that will always return 30 degrees, right? We can do that. Writing a unit test for this function is trivial, and we get that for free. Now, performance still suck. Because the main reason why the performance sucked before was, this, was that, well, mainly two things, really. State t, which is an abomination in Scala, and uh, at Scala set in both cats, like, it would never work correctly, I mean, performantly. Um, but also the fact that we are building those stacks of monads. And whenever you do bind, whenever you do flat maps and all that, it has to go through that pyramid of hell just to roll back. And yet for another flat map, it has to do the same. It will just be super, super slow. So we didn't get any of that. But maintainability is all right. So can we do better? If we look at it, the program itself Look, we don't really have to change anything to it. The only thing that we have to change is the final type. That is right now the state t of reader t of either t of task, which is just horrible, and that's the pain of our performance. The beauty of the solution is that now you can reason about your performance in one single place, in main. Nowhere else. 
because I can provide an instance of monad state, so instance of that type class monad state that will no longer be based on state T. I can provide you one that is based on atomic reference. And we can re then we can remove it from the stack. And uh, guess what? We, we are twice as fast right now. I don't have benchmarks with me, probably I should. We can, well, what about reader T? Uh, well, we needed it to have an instance of applicative ask. But the question is, do we have to provide a value configuration close over some reader T? No, we don't. We can provide a very simple instance called const. You just give it a value E, and that gives you an instance of applicative ask. And that's it. That's all you need. That's a, a constant value. No pain, no cost of stacking monads together. If you provide that instance, reader t disappears. And you end up if a t of task. And you are order of magnitude faster right now than we were just a moment ago without touching any of business logic at all. And we get the performance that we wanted to have, which I guess is pretty cool. But can we do better? Given that I have, I'm actually good. All right, so can we do better? The, our last frontier, and this is what we are unfortunately not having in our chain. Some people are happy about it, I'm sad. Let me tell you why. Final frontier is that either T of task. And why does it bother me? First of all, performance. You might ask, OK, why didn't you do yet another trick? Why didn't you remove either T of task and do some fancy magic? Well, because if I ha wanted to have an instance of applicative error for task, that it's not, that's not doable. I cannot give you an instance of task of any A for some error E. I could do that if the error was a throwable, if it was an exception. So we could do a little change here, and we could see what happens if I change, and I say, all my errors extends throwable. Then, then the final type will be just task, and I can give you an instance of applicative error for task, and guess what? It's going to be the roughly twice as fast as the previous implementation and at the same point, as fast as the imperative one. There are mostly no costs when running the program. But you don't want to have that. Why? The whole idea behind having an applicative error, having a concept of reason about errors, is that you have some sort of ADT, you have some sort of finite set of errors, set of errors in your program on which you can reason about. If an error happened, you can do pattern matching against it, and do, oh, if, if that's, you know, like a timeout, I do this. If it's, uh, bless you, if like server not available, then I do that, that stuff. Now, if my error extends throughable, then I'm more or less screwed because anyone can just yet add another type here, of which I will be not aware here when I'm dealing with this scrap, right? So that's probably not what I want. I would like to have something like that because it's damn fast. My final type is just task, it's just the I.O. type, nothing else. But I don't want to give away uh, robustness and not being you know, scared to run this stuff in production just for being more performant. There's another problem. If you have an either T of task, you at this point end up with two channels of errors. Because your task may throw an exception, and it will sometimes. And also, your either, your either T of task, it might be a left or right, an error or something. So now when you get this type, you have to deal, well, well it could be a left, or it could be a task which is throwing an exception, so you have to call attempt. You have to do some reasoning about that thing as well. So that's not cool. And lastly, you can never really trust your function at this point uh, because you might get, well, if you, if you call functions like that, you return some f of a, and you never know if somebody just called attempt on it. And you also, at this point, pretty screwed. And you al always have to reason about your functions. Like, in function programming, you should never, never, never go to implementation of the function to, in order to understand what it's doing. 
If you're doing that, you're doing something wrong. It should be pretty straightforward. It just goes from this input to that output. That's pretty much it, what it's doing. With that, that's not always the case. So the answer to that problem might be something which is called BIO, uh, uh, bifunctor IO. BIO, sorry, wrong slides. Two implementations, one for Scala Z. Well, the one that is in Scala Z isn't really any longer for Scala Z. It's actually right now dependency less. You can use it with anything you really want, with your CATS program as well. There is a one dedicated for CATS, uh, which was created by Luca. But they, they both come with the same idea that your I.O. type, that your task previously, is no longer parameterized by A, it's no longer always parameterized by E, the error type. Now, when you instantiate, let's say you have some imperative code that you don't know how to reason about, you don't know what that is, that's a third party, it might throw exceptions, you don't know. You wrap it over a task as you did before. Previously, we would just get a task of A, right? We would know what happened, absolutely no idea to reason about it if you push this object forward. Somebody gets it at, you know, in this other part of your program. Here, you wrap some imperative program which you don't control, so then you say that E is throwable. You explicitly say, I don't know what errors might happen in this I.O. But the difference is that information is right now in the type signature. That's the main difference. So if somebody else eventually gets it, he knows, oh, it's an I.O. that produces city. Crap, it can also fail with anything. So now that, that's the, their responsibility to do like some, some function that goes from, from throwable to some error that we know. But that information is not lost. It's, it propagates along types. And lastly, with that second type, param type parameter to that I.O., we can finally implement the applicative error for this I.O. And our programs will get, in order which implementation you use, twice as fast or an order of magnitude fast, which I think is pretty damn cool. That's all that I have. Hope you guys were not bored. Thank you very much.